Good morning to our three congregations. We have a somewhat depleted congregation here in the church. We have the Zoom congregation and we have the um, YouTube congregation, but we're all one in Christ. So welcome to you all and may God bless you during our service. Just before we start, a word about communion. We will be having communion later on in the service. If you are at home, you know the drill, you get ready whatever you're going to drink and eat to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you're here in the church with us, did you pick up one of these little communion things on the way in? Have you all got one? I'll explain how to use it when the time comes. Please don't try and open it in the meantime because you'll probably cover yourself with grape juice in the process. So I'll explain when the time comes, as long as you've all got one. Before we start, um, we all, I think, all know Edna of Edna and Cyril. Edna is in hospital. She is very seriously ill. Uh, Jenny is very distraught. She had to drop her mother off and say, well, I've dropped my mother off and I don't know if I will see her again. So I'm going to pray for Edna and Jenny. Father, these are hard times and Jenny would love to be with her mother. We commit them both to you, Lord, knowing that you are a compassionate God and that great the trial, great the grace. So we ask that you will be present. We ask that you would comfort, give peace to both Jenny and to Edna. You would guide the staff in the hospital that they would give Edna the utmost care. In Jesus' name, amen. An opening reading here. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. And he asked the question, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And the answer, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. We stand. We can't enter his presence because we don't have clean hands and a pure heart. But we do have a saviour who does. So let's pray a prayer of confession and faith at the same time. We pray this together. Father, the earth is indeed yours and everything in it too. You found it and established it. And because you are holy, you demand absolute holiness from all who live in it. But we have sinned. Even this week, the work of our hands and the thoughts of our minds have not been clean and pure. In fact, we cannot, we're not even able to be consistently holy. Were it not for Jesus, you had every right to banish us forever from your presence. For his sake, and on the basis of his righteousness, please count us as righteous. Forgive us and receive us into your holy presence. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Richard. And let me add my welcome to that of Richard's. Um, welcome to Christchurch Howick, either physically or virtually via Zoom or YouTube. Uh, my name is Andy Park. I'm the rector here at Christchurch Howick. And it's a great joy to be uh, sharing the family news, but also bringing you the word a little later on. Just a word of explanation, this window into your world section of our service is a way for us to see what others have been doing. We can't stand around and have a cup of tea afterwards and see what you've been up to during your week. And so this is our substitute for that, just to show you uh, what a few people have sent in photographs uh, of what they've been doing. So here we go. This is from Alaric. Uh, it's actually a week late. Alaric sent this to me about 10 days ago. He was at the Ben V Gardens uh, with his family. Uh, beautiful gardens. I've never been there, but I've been told I have to get there soon. So we're planning a trip out to Ben V soon. Is it Ben V or Ben Vi? I never. Ben V. Ben V Gardens. And then from Mara out in the Dargal with her beloved goats. Um, so just a picture of their farm and a very busy time, uh, spring, all the babies being born and all the rest of it. Um, and then this is from my daughter down in Somerset West. Um, they had a huge storm down there. It brought down all the power lines. So she's a teacher at the school and uh, they were trying to teach without electricity and it was a, a big disaster uh, at, during the last cold front that came through. So trees came down all over the show. And then here's a, a tragic one. Um, uh, Maxwell, many of us will remember Maxwell. Remember, I think almost our last physical service before the lockdown, I baptized their little boy, Stephen. And uh, this is Maxwell. He's a car guard up at the top pick and pay at the top of the hill. And uh, last week, in maybe Friday, I think it was, uh, he was involved in a hit and run. They took him, someone crashed into him on his bicycle uh, and then sped off and left him with a very badly broken ankle and terribly badly grazed. And uh, he had to go off to Northdale and uh, have x-rays and a cast put on. And so, um, shame, he's going to be out of work for the next few weeks. You can't be a car guard with your leg and plaster and on crutches. Um, so just an awful experience for poor Maxwell. Um, and uh, yeah, who does that? Hey, um, leave some dead or alive lying on the side of the road. Well, then just in terms of a few notices for, for the week coming up, firstly, a couple of birthdays. Um, Penny is today, Penny Holder, also a fairly newcomer to our service before the COVID uh, caught us, and Glenn Horner later this week, and Andrew Anderson, also a new, newish family, Andy, Andy and Susie Anderson. Anderson. Um, live out there near um, Hebron Haven, and it's Andy's birthday this week. So happy birthday to all of you. And we don't know of any anniversaries. Uh, so if you do have an anniversary in the next seven days, uh, you need to tell us so that we can update our records and remember you on your special day. And then just a plug for a new prayer meeting that Richard has started on Zoom. So you do need to have Zoom to do this. First thing on a Monday morning, 7 a.m., 15 minutes with Jesus, from 7 till 7.15, uh, a very short and simple prayer meeting. And it's, that launched last week, and it was fantastic. So uh, you really uh, did miss out if you weren't there. So if you have got Zoom and you can get on at 7, just 15 minutes, um, it's really, it really was a lovely time last week, and that will be running on a weekly basis. And then uh, just a reminder that next Sunday, immediately after the service, we'll be having a short special vestry meeting uh, where we need to just discuss the car park. Uh, those that are here can see what's going on. That level has been lifted, I don't know, two or three meters already. Um, so it's looking good, but we do need to um, apply for some financing from our denomination. Um, they offer loans at a much better rate than the bank. And uh, we just need the church's agreement uh, if, 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 if they're going to give us that money. We're wanting to obviously complete the work out there. The soil's been uh, donated to us as a gift, which is unbelievable, but we are going to have to sort out our driveway, which actually needed to be sorted out a long time ago, as well as the culvert, things like that. So we need to borrow a bit of money for that. But straight after the service next week, if you can uh, just uh, make arrangements to stay here, uh, if you are here or uh, if you're at home, we'll be carrying on with the vestry meeting after the service. And just a reminder of our offering, we can't hand bags around, but there is a box in the foyer uh, for you to pop your offering in there if you've come prepared for that. Otherwise, there's our banking detail 
our standard uh, banking detail that's on our notices and on our website if you're looking for that to continue your support of the gospel work. And then for those with kids or those who know people with children, tell them to get onto Zoom at 5 o'clock via our website. They'll be able to click on a link. And uh, Agent Doug and Agent Z um, are the secret agents that are teaching our children um, from the book of uh, Exodus. And so they'll be continuing with the next exciting adventure through the book of Exodus, 5 p.m., 5 o'clock in the afternoon is our children's church via Zoom. All right, I'm going to hand back to Richard, who is going to take us through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Andy. This is actually a very special celebration of the Lord's Supper because it's the first time that you who are here with us have been able to take the Lord's Supper with us. We've been doing it on Zoom, each person in their own home, united in Christ, but together apart physically. But now you can join us, and this is wonderful. I'm going to explain how these work. If you look carefully, there's a, a see-through cellophane layer on top. If you peel that back, there's a little wafer inside. That's the bread. When the time comes, if you peel back the, the uh, silver layer, you'll find there's juice inside. So it's a two layer strip. Don't pull the silver strip off before you've had the, uh, the bread. Does anybody need help? The Lord's Supper is for believers. And what unites us is our belief in the one God, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And I don't know how you feel. I, I always feel triumphant when I say the creed for, on three accounts. One, I'm confirming that there is a God. And that's wonderful news. Secondly, God has enabled me to see that he is there, to know that he is there. And I'm privileged in that, and I rejoice in that. And thirdly, I delight in telling the world that I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth. So let's say the creed. Don't be put off by, by your masks. Shout it out. Sorry. I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, he died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Christ's holy universal church, the fellowship of Christians, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We've already confessed to God that we fall far short of his standards, that we are sinners, but let's pray together the prayer of humble access. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. Without your gracious forgiveness, we are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table. But the finished work of redemption by your dear Son, Jesus Christ, has made us fit to be welcome in your presence. Grant, therefore, that as we eat and drink, we may by faith remember the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and his body, the church. We ask that as we do this, we may be united to him and he to us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, of your infinite mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. 
who made thereby his one offering of himself, never to be repeated, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Hear us, merciful Father, and God that we, receiving this bread and juice in accordance with your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, holy institution to remember his death and suffering, grant that we may share in his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. As one body in Christ, we peel back and we eat our bread in remembrance. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We take the cup and we drink. Almighty God, we bring you praise and thanksgiving and ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a holy and lifelong offering to you. Lord, accept this duty and service we owe you, not because we deserve it, but because of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name alone we come to you. Amen. Please remember the care fund. The care fund, I think, is being used as never before at the moment because of the, the lockdown and the circumstances. Uh, there is a box, I imagine, on your way out where you can give to that or you can give on the internet. Please advise us if you know of anybody who is in need. There's a button you can press. That's a picture of a button that you can press on the screen if you go to our website and send us a message. Otherwise, you can contact Andy or you can contact any one of us, really. But please, if you know somebody in need, let us know. We move on and we're going to pray. And Deirdre Fripp is going to pray for us. Let us pray. Almighty Sovereign Lord, we thank you for the amazing gift of prayer and for the privilege of approaching the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy to help us in our time of need. But first we come to praise and worship you. O oh Lord, we lift up our hearts in worship and humble ourselves before you. We repent and pray for forgiveness in our personal lives and thank you that in Jesus Christ we have forgiveness for his sacrifice on the cross. Your faithfulness and love continue throughout all generations. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We bring before you Christ Church Howick and give thanks for Andy, Richard, John, Myra, and all those who feed us with sound doctrine. Thank you for the technology which has kept us together. Lord, you know that we are in urgent need of a treasurer and pray that in your time we will be able to fill this post. You've empowered us to be your witnesses and to take the gospel to the lost, not only in Howick but further afield, to our families, friends and neighbours who need to come to Jesus for salvation. May our church be a shining light in the surrounding darkness. Much prayer and wisdom is needed in how we may progress in proclaiming Christ to the lost over this period. We lift up our missionaries to you at this time, many who have been affected by the lockdown, 
but that we pray that they will soon be able to return to the places where they have been spreading the gospel. We are mindful of those who are in dangerous situations and pray for their protection. We commit to you all those organizations also reaching out. We bring before you those who are grieving, the lonely, those suffering depression, the lost, the anxious, particularly those in our church. We pray for those in authority and commit our president and the government to you. We ask that you give them wisdom, unity, uprightness and transparency as they address the, the many problems facing them, the economy, the pandemic, corruption, the jobless, gender violence and racism. We commit to you the doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, hospital staff, those in care centres and ask for your protection. We pray a vaccine will soon be found. O oh Lord, draw this hurting world back to you. When we look back in history, may we remember the revival, hope and peace that came out of this season. Thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign in all things and all is in your power and authority. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may want to know you better and, you, and live in your presence daily. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Hear the word of the Lord. The parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, the man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Tish, thank you for reading. Well, I know Andy has labored in the week to bring us an exposition of that word. So Andy, now's your moment. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tish, for reading that so well. Uh, for those, well, even those who are here, um, but certainly those out on Zoom, there's a dog that's barking uh, next door, so that's a bit irritating. Um, that dog is lucky John Jardine isn't here, if we remember what John did to the Hardy Dars. But um, we're just going to have to put up with that. Uh, we're not allowed to do illegal things as the church. Well, friends, every Sunday we've been looking at something that Jesus said in the Bible that we wish he hadn't, something that is countercultural, something that runs against what we think and what our culture thinks, something that makes it hard to be a Christian sometimes. 
And today, we're looking at that very famous phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, which at first you might think was a nice thing for Jesus to say, maybe a bit superfluous, but nonetheless a nice thing for Jesus to say. We like the idea of neighborly love, you know, having the neighbors over for a bri, feeding the neighbors dogs, throwing the, their kids' ball back over the wall. It's nice when neighbors love each other. It's nice to live in a community of neighbors like that. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor, we like it. It makes sense. And it sounds, it sounds manageable. But of course, as usual, as Jesus has been doing every week in this series, he throws a huge spanner in the works, and he turns the tables on us. And what he's actually saying, I think you'll agree by the end of it, is quite shocking. Well, the first point we need to see from our passage is that Jesus says God will give us heaven if we obey the law. In our story, we meet a man who comes to Jesus with a question. You might want to look in your Bibles at verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there are a couple of things worth noticing about this man. He's a Jewish scholar, we're told, a specialist in Jewish religious law. And he comes with a question to Jesus, but he's not really interested in finding out the answer is he? So why did he come with the question? Well, we we're told it was to test Jesus. He's trying actually to trap Jesus. You see, this man was an expert in the law. He knew exactly what he had to do to inherit eternal life. We see that later in verse 27. He had dedicated his life to studying God's laws. He would have learned the first five books of the Bible off by heart, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I'm not just talking about the names of those books. He would have known the books off by heart, every last word in those books. He was a theologian and a scholar and would have been a highly respected member of society. He had heard how popular Jesus had become with all the irreligious sorts, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, and so on. And he reckons that this Jesus clearly has no respect for God because he's lowering the bar. He's friends with all sorts. So he comes to confront Jesus, to test Jesus, to try and catch Jesus out with a question that he thinks he knows the answer to. It's a bit like asking this little guy who ate his sister's Easter eggs. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He knew the answer way before he asked the question. Now, before we look at Jesus' answer, we need to acknowledge that this is a question that we've all asked at one point. What must I do to be okay with God? What must I do to make sure that when I die, I go to heaven or paradise or whatever else it is? And so it's also a question, it's a question we've all asked, but it's also a question that we've all answered. We've come up with an answer for ourselves. And actually, we all have the same answer to that question. What must we do to inherit eternal life? We must be good. We might express that differently. The religious types would say that we've got to go to church or mosque or the temple the community-minded would say we've got to clean up our town and help the prostitutes and drug addicts. The tree huggers will say that we've got to save the seals and stop global warming. But we're all actually saying exactly the same thing. We've got to be good if we want to go to heaven. If I'm good, if other people don't have a problem with me, I shouldn't imagine God has got a problem with me either. And friends, it's an easy mistake to make because our whole society is based on the reward system. If you work hard, you get a bonus. If the kids are good, they get a treat. If you pass your exams, you'll get a guitar or maybe a car, depending on, on what, what your income is. It's an easy mistake to make when it comes to thinking about God as well. And Jesus says it's a bad mistake to make when it comes to thinking 
about going to heaven. Look at Jesus' answer. He says in verse 26, he asks the man a question back. What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? Jesus knows this guy is testing him. And so he's basically saying, let's stop playing games here. You're an expert in the law. You know what the Bible says you need to do if you want to go to heaven. And Jesus answers this question with a question. What does the Bible say? This man had come to test Jesus, but suddenly he finds Jesus testing him. But this is an easy question that Jesus is asking. Every single week in the synagogue, the Jews would recite their confession of faith. They had taken Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, put them together, and that was their creed that they would say every single week. The man, Jesus says to the man, you know the answer as well as I do. When you read out that confession in the synagogue every week, and the expert in the law answers correctly. He answers verse 27, we must love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, and we must love our neighbor as ourselves. Every Jew believed that that was the way to please God. And Jesus congratulates his accuser for giving the right answer. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Friends, it's so simple, isn't it? According to Jesus, if you want to inherit eternal life, all you have to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. If you live like that, why in the world would God refuse you a place in his heaven? This must be the biggest exam leak ever. You just have to obey these two itty-bitty little commands and you will have eternal life. Well, that takes the wind out of the man's sails a bit. And in fact, something starts to niggle in the back of this man's mind. If the way to get to heaven is by loving God and loving your neighbor, then what happens if you don't love God or you don't particularly love your neighbor? He's not too worried about the first, of course, he had devoted his whole life to studying God's laws. No one knew more about God than this expert in the law. He knew God's laws inside out. So from the outside, it really looks like Jesus couldn't fault him as far as loving God was concerned. But you see, loving his neighbor, well, that's a little bit more tricky. And that brings us to our second point this morning. If we, we don't obey the law, so we don't deserve heaven. If you love God and love your neighbor, you will live, says Jesus. But something is worrying this man, so he continues the conversation. He says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Just notice why he asked this question. Luke tells us he wants to justify himself. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He wants to be sure that he's in the clear, so he asks for clarification. Who is my neighbor? What do you think he expected Jesus to say? I reckon he thought the same as what you and I would think. If you love your family, if you love your friends, well then God will reward you with a place in heaven. That's what he expected Jesus to say. But just notice what this religious man is doing here. He's lowering the bar. He's asking Jesus to narrow down the field a bit. Jesus, you can't mean I must love everyone. Can you be a little bit more specific? Who specifically, who exactly is this neighbor that I should be loving? What he's really asking is, who isn't my neighbor that I don't need to worry about? Who don't I need to love? Give me a checklist of my neighbors so that I can tick them off and then I don't have to worry about all the rest. You see, he's trying to make God's law more attainable. He came to test Jesus because he thought Jesus had been lowering the bar, associating with all sorts. But now he's the one that's lowering the bar. Well, Jesus won't have anything of this bar lowering, and so he tells this parable that absolutely shatters any hope this man might have had of getting into heaven. 
because Jesus raises that bar way up again. The man asks, who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The victim in the story was almost certainly a Jew, since he was traveling between the Jewish cities of Jerusalem and Jericho. Everyone knew that road. It was actually called the Red Road, the road of death, because of the number of ambushes and murders that happened along the way. If that had been in South Africa, the road would have had signs saying, hijacking hotspot every kilometer. It really would have. It was renowned for how dangerous that journey was. Predictably, this lone traveler is ambushed, stripped of his clothes, and left bleeding and unconscious on the side of the road. Well, three people come past. And by the way, it's no accident that Jesus chooses three characters to make this point. Jesus is a master storyteller, and three characters in a story is a well-known pattern. It's like the three little pigs. We still use that technique today in storytelling. The first two little pigs get deeper and deeper into trouble, but you know all along that the third little pig is going to be the hero. He is going to save the day. Well, the first person is a priest. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. This was someone in full-time ministry, a professional worker at the temple, a man, a man of the cloth, part of the clergy, and he passes by. What would he have been thinking? I think something like this. If I stop and help this guy, I'll probably get robbed myself, and that's not helping anyone. Anyway, this guy looks practically dead, and I can't touch a corpse, or I will make myself ceremonially unclean. And I'm sure someone else will come along and help him. And so he makes up his mind about what to do, and he does absolutely nothing nothing. He knows he should love his neighbor, but there's no way of knowing if this victim is a neighbor or not, and so he goes on his way. Now, at that point, our friend, the expert in the law, would have been thinking, typical. Isn't that typical? Isn't that exactly what you would expect from a priest, from the clergy? Well, the next man to come along is a Levite. Levites were like lay people, bit like uh, Robin Townsend or, or Shane or people that help out in the church, deacons maybe in the Baptist church. Well, maybe he will help the man lying on the side of the road. Verse 32, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, passed by on the other side. His reaction is exactly the same. How was he meant to know if this guy was a neighbor or not? And at this point, the expert in the law would have been thinking, typical, All the clergy are the same, too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. We've had a full-time religious worker. Now we've had a part-time religious worker. Who would you have expected to turn out to be the hero of the story? Who would you expect the third person to be? Well, surely a non-professional, God-fearing, ordinary Jew, a farmer or a merchant, maybe even a scholar like this man maybe a fellow expert in the law, he would come along and be the hero to save the day. But he's in for a huge shock. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had pity on him. The third person in the story isn't a religious man. He's not a scholar. He's not a farmer. In fact, he's not even a Jew. He's a Samaritan. What a shock. When I say the word Samaritan, what do you think of? Maybe the sort of person who stops to help you when you get a puncture in your tire. Maybe that charity organization in the UK that helps people who are considering suicide. The Oxford Dictionary says that a Samaritan is a genuinely charitable person. But this expert and the rest of Jesus' disciples wouldn't have been thinking genuinely charitable person when Jesus said the word Samaritan. They would have been thinking dirty, rotten Samaritan. You see, there was no love lost between Jews and Samaritans. The Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were scum. 
The Samaritans came from the area up north from Jerusalem. They claimed to be Jewish in their heritage, but they were half-breeds. They were mongrels. They were heretics, and the Jews absolutely hated them. There's a Jewish book called the Mishnah, which contains wise sayings and traditions that all Jews should keep. In chapter 8, verse 10, it says, The one who eats bread baked by a Samaritan is like one who eats the flesh of a pig. We call this story the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, to the Jew, the only Good Samaritan was a dead Samaritan. As Jesus told the story, the Jews would have been thinking, oh, here we go. The Samaritan is going to kick this poor guy on the head. How wrong they were, because the Samaritan begins to show all kinds of mercy. Verse 34, he went to the man, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. The Samaritan spares no expense. He gives the victim immediate care. He cleans the wounds with the oil, he disinfects them with the wine, and he bandages the man up. But he didn't leave it there. There's follow-up care as well. He put the man on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. A Samaritan arriving at an inn with an unconscious Jew would be like a Sioux Indian arriving at a fort with a half-dead cowboy. And the Samaritan doesn't just drop the man off at the inn. Did you notice that? The care continues all through that night. So there's immediate relief. Then there's follow-up care. But there's also long-term provision. Look at verse 35. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So he's not content to leave the job half finished. He wants to make sure that this guy comes back to full health. One night at an inn would have cost the twelfth of a denarius. The Samaritan pays the man, pays for the man to stay there for about three and a half weeks. And notice that he doesn't cap that either. He says if there's any extra expense, I'll cover that too when I come back. There's immediate relief. There's follow-up care, and then there's long-term provision. Friends, this Samaritan is unreasonable with the care that he gives. He outdoes Mother Teresa. No man ever offered another man so much love and so much compassion. It is completely over the top. Jesus is showing us how we should be loving our neighbors, but he's also showing who we should be loving as our neighbors. By putting a Samaritan helping a Jew in the story, Jesus couldn't have found a more forceful way of saying, everyone is your neighbor. Everyone, regardless of race, religion, politics, social standing, everyone is your neighbor. Not everyone, of course, is your brother and sister in Christ, but everyone made in the image of God is your neighbor. Do you remember at the start of the parable, the expert in the law asked, who is my neighbor? Who must I love? He was trying to narrow the field down a little bit. And Jesus is saying, your neighbor is everyone you meet. Muslim, atheist, refugee, Indian, Zulu, white, prostitute, homeless, disabled, elderly, student, working class, upper class, middle class, there are your neighbors. You ask the question, there are your neighbors. If you love them all, you will go to heaven, says Jesus. And Jesus throws that question back at the expert of the law. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Even though he can't bring himself to even say the word Samaritan, the law expert has to admit that the Samaritan in the story has done the impossible. He has kept God's law perfectly. Jesus says that this Samaritan is the sort of person we must be if we want any chance of going to heaven, of inheriting eternal life. In one 
Peanuts cartoon, you know, the cartoon Peanuts. Uh, Lucy is holding the rugby ball while Charlie Brown runs up to take the kick. At the last sh second, she pulls the ball away and Charlie Brown lands flat on his back. And Charlie Brown says, of course I love the human race. I just can't stand Lucy. Well, unfortunately, Charlie Brown, Lucy is the person against whom your love will be measured, not the human race. Who is God going to use to measure your love for your neighbor? Who, in other words, is your Lucy? The one that you should love, but don't. Helen Ziller, Julius Malema, Eugene Tablanche, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, maybe the guy who revs his engine next door on a Sunday morning, or maybe the sort of person who knocks people off their bicycles and races off without seeing if they're dead or alive. Who is the person or group of people who shows up the deficiency of your love and who proves that you don't deserve to go to heaven? God says he will give you heaven if you obey the law. We don't obey the law, do we? So we don't deserve heaven. But thank God, Jesus is the great Samaritan who gives us what we don't deserve. If you had to put yourself into the story, who would you be? Who would you identify best with in the story? I guess we'd all like to see ourselves as being the good Samaritan. But in reality, if we're honest, we're probably closer to being the priest or the Levite because we don't love our neighbors with all our hearts, do we? The parable exposes us. It convicts us. It shows us what our hearts are actually really like. A better question, though, is where does God put you in the story? From God's perspective, we are actually the guy lying helpless and half dead on the side of the road. Ephesians says that. Ephesians says that we are dead in our transgressions and sins. And Romans says the same thing. In chapter 7, Paul says, I delight in the law of God, but I see another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that controls me. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, because we don't love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and because I can't love my neighbor as myself, there is, no, there is no way I can do enough to inherit eternal life. I'm dead in the water, or maybe I should say I'm dead on the side of the road. We don't come close to being the Good Samaritan, do we? But luckily for us, there is someone who does. You see, Jesus is our great Samaritan. God knew that we can't love like the Samaritan, and so moved by pity, he came, like the Samaritan, in the person of Jesus, to travel that dangerous road to find us and love us and rescue us. Jesus came looking for us and was willing to touch the spiritually unclean, to bind up our wounds, to bring us back to health. Jesus isn't just the good Samaritan, he is the great Samaritan. Because in order to help us, he swapped places with us on the side of the road. He willingly became a victim of wicked and violent men in your place. Although he never sinned, he was rejected and condemned and sentenced to death. The Jews said, the only good Samaritan is a dead Samaritan. And the religious leaders of Israel said, the only good Jesus is a dead Jesus, and so they killed him. He died not to pay for his sins, but to pay for your sins. He paid the cost to make us better, to heal us, to make us whole, to bring us back to God, restore us to God. So what is left for us to do? Well, all we can do is what the victim in Jesus' story did. All we can do is receive Jesus' kindness. Like the victim, we too have done nothing deserving of kindness, yet this is exactly what we've been shown by God. He is the one who, in the expert's own words, had mercy. So friends, have you accepted the mercy that God has offered you yet? I need to wrap up.
Friends, do you remember the question that the expert in the law asked at the beginning? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an illogical question. It's a nonsensical question. There is nothing we can do to inherit heaven. There is nothing you can do to inherit anything, actually. You don't earn an inheritance. Inheritances aren't rewards and they're not wages. They are gifts. And friends, thank goodness eternal life is a gift and not a reward because none of us have earned it or deserve it. If you're a Christian here today, if you've given up trying to impress God by keeping rules and instead you've started trusting that Jesus kept God's rules for you, friends, if that's you, you have been shown great mercy. And today Jesus is saying, go and do likewise. Go and show mercy to those who don't deserve it. Go and show the comprehensive, indiscriminate love that God has shown you. But more importantly, go and tell your friends where they can find God's mercy. Tell them about the real good Samaritan, the great Samaritan, who died to rescue them from their sins. I may wish that Jesus hadn't said, love your neighbor, because that's exactly what disqualifies me from going to heaven. But boy, I'm glad he did, because that's exactly what he has done for me. It is only by Jesus loving and dying for me, his undeserving neighbor, that I will ever be welcomed into heaven. Won't you bow with me and pray? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this undeserved act of kindness and mercy that you have shown us in coming to earth, living out uh, a perfect life in perfect obedience to the law, uh, and then dying for our sins on the cross. Thank you that that perfect life can become mine and that my sins can be washed away through what Jesus did on the cross. If only I will transfer my trust and my faith to him. And Father, as we go from this place, help us to be like Jesus, the good Samaritan, the great Samaritan, showing undeserved, indiscriminate love to anyone we meet, anyone at all. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, a great song to finish off with that ties up so nicely. Uh, my heart is filled with thankfulness, and it really should be if you've accepted uh, God's forgiveness for your sins. Again, uh, you can sing along behind your masks um, and just follow the words that will come up on the screen.
from our sister church at Stellenbosch, Christ Church Stellenbosch. So uh, we thank them for letting us use their music. Well, friends, why don't we close our time by saying these words together. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Well, thank you so much for joining us, especially those who took the trouble to come out this morning and be here physically. It's a great treat to see live people, real people. And uh, I can't say stay and have a cup of tea, I'm afraid, but um, it was great being with you. Hello, Maxwell. Hello, hello. <laughs> yes, hello, Maxwell. Uh, how are you? Sorry. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, though, but not a little bit. Uh, it's, sorry, it's happening. But I just trust, trust God. It's just good. He's going to go take that back. Just see that maybe I'll die. But uh, anyway, and uh, mess, thanks for uh, Mr. Pete and uh, Miss Beth Vodge for quick coming, take me to doctors. And I uh, think now it's better. Good. 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 We, we will pray it heals very quickly, Maxwell. Thanks so much, huh? Mm. God Thanks bless you. you. Hello, Liz, can you hear me? Hi there. Okay, the church can see you nice and clearly on the aspect big screen here. Hello, everybody. I think of you all there, and it was wonderful to hear Richard's voice echoing in a building, we knew that he was speaking from a church building, and thank, I do thank everybody for your contributions today, especially the wonderful exposition of the Good Samaritan. Thank you so much. Hello, Deirdre. Hello. Well, and lovely service. Really uh, marvelous service. And thank you very much, and bless you all. Hi, everyone. Lovely, <laughs> lovely prayer. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was lovely, lovely to see everybody in the church. And um, thanks, Andy and Shane and everybody else involved. It was fantastic. Lovely. Pleasure. John is there, Andy. I think he's, um, I think he's guarding the cars. Yes, here we go. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, everyone. So Hi. glad to be worshipping uh, with people in that building again. And we're, we're long that we can be together and then we can have true fellowship in Christ in the flesh as well. Thank you, one and all, for making our time of worship and the praise of our Lord Jesus Christ so real and so relevant as we seek, Lord and his will in what we're doing. Thank you very much for making this sacrifice for us that we can be together. Thank you. I'm close to the mic. Can you, 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 we were far, far, far away from the mic, yes. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, we're here at home with Eileen. And, uh, thanks very much to you all for a wonderful service. Thanks mm. for a lovely word, uh, well, challenging word, Andy, and uh, Lovely prayers, Deirdre. Yeah. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, it's lovely to see you back at church. And um, you'll notice there's quite a few extra seats. So I'd like to um, encourage people to put their names down. We are still, you do have to put your name down to come, but there's lots of space. And it's lovely to be back here, even though we're sitting apart and we can't have tea. It's so nice to see people and at least brief at the door and stuff. So thanks everyone for a great service. And we are, hope we can get back to normal soon. But yeah. in the meantime, <laughs> come if you can. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Fiona. All right, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Good morning, everyone. We've got some slightly different scenery this morning. Mum's house sitting. And so um, we've come to do, to do church at the house sitting house. 
and we had a, a golden oriole come um, into the tree nearby. We're sitting out on yeah, the yeah. veranda. So we've got to see yeah. the this morning. Thanks so much, guys. It was, it was really lovely joining you and, and watching the service from this end. This is David Wilton's brother. Hello. Hi there. Good to see you, Peter. Hello, Shane. Are you making Are you good? Well? Yeah, I'm making good progress. Thank you. I, I got the all clear last week. Okay. So I can go. I can go back to Jakarta, which is more dangerous than than Singapore. But well, thanks for coming in on the webcam and. Uh, and yes, I, and tell tell that dog it's the most well-travelled bark of any dog in South Africa. <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh, I'm having such trouble with my phone this morning. Oh. We we were on uh, on YouTube and now I've got back on to Zoom. And it was a lovely service. Thank you. Well, thanks for tuning in. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Oh, we look forward to coming back. We can't make it next week, but. Uh, two Sundays from today, we'll be back in the church. We'll book in advance. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, Phil and Bill, for that. Okay, guys. <laughs> there we are. Cheers. Bobby and Nana. <coughs> Just give us a wave. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for the service. Very good, very clear, and it ran, went very well, 100%. 100%. And, and it really did. Everything went well, yeah, thank you. Hello, Val and Bill. Hi, Liz. Hello, Steve. Hi, how are you? Very well, and you? <laughs> good to see you at last. <laughs> thank you. Rather cold today. Um, yeah, it's only, only 10 degrees, so it'll be an inside day. When is it going to be 30 again? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got an inside day. I've got an outside day. I've got a painting job, <laughs> so she's sending me to do it. Ah. Have a great you. week. And to you. Have a good week. Thank you. Look forward to <laughs> seeing you soon. Cheers. Bill, when are you going to do the park run again? As soon as I open. I actually, oh, okay. uh, a lot of people are doing unofficial runs on that track. And, are they? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm going to do it. I've tried to do it from home to do a five kilometer run around hike, but it's not the same. <laughs> No, it's a bit more boring. Yeah. Yeah. Or comp so, yeah, I will be back as soon as we can. Good, Good. Good. Bye. Good to see you. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Stay on for a few minutes. I'm going to just go outside and, and just do a quick video feed showing you the parking area. That's a lot of ground there. Eh? Um, there's still a lot of earth to come in, um, but you can see already it's lifted up. There's a, if you look at the bottom section there, it's a, a hang of a lot higher than it was, which has made, yeah. really made a big difference. But still a lot of earth to come in.